California right now. And you know, it feels like we're almost out of drought, and for some reason, Texas decided to give us all the rain back at the same time. So, <laughs> but it could be worse for being healthy. So, so thank you all very much for giving me the chance to talk to you all about uh, some of the research that I've been doing. And actually, um, you know, I'm appreciative of the fact that you all kind of mentioned that, you know, Dr. Talon, you will be talking to your group later on, because this is kind of a good segue into the fact that um, what I'm going to be talking to you about is by no means a, a, an independent project. This is a collaborative project looking at the impacts of alien plant species on arthropod communities, arthropods including insects, um, spiders, millipedes, centipedes, a lot of beads, all the creepy crawlies, so to speak. And I, I will mention that um, this is actually part of a book chapter. Um, so we, we stand on the shoulders of giants, as we say, in terms of our, our research and everything. And it's worth mentioning that in many ways this is kind of a marriage of the research that I've had a chance and opportunity to be blessed to be part of because my co-authors and collaborators, um, Dr. Andrea Litt was my master's advisor when we were focused on looking at invasive plant species down in South Texas. So we were trying to learn about what else could we do to KR blue stem and clavered blue stem to try to get rid of it. Surprise this century, our research did not work as intended. Um, and then Dr. Talamy was my PhD advisor when I went to the University of Delaware looking at the impacts of invasive plants in the mid-Atlantic region of the US and looking at how they mess with the food webs. So we, we pulled our assets together here and our resources and our intelligence and put together a book chapter that will be available later on this year, um, focusing on biological invasions and global insect decline. And we will be contributing to the aspect of looking at how alien plants impact native arthropod communities. So I will make a quick uh, addendum here. As I'm talking about uh, today's talk, I will be using the terms non-native, invasive, and alien plants synonymously. Um, it is worth mentioning that in, in the popular culture of today, the PC term is now to refer to these things as aliens, not invasive. Um, but I have grown up in an era where we refer to these things as invasive in the negative connotation, so forgive me if I end up using those terms every now and then. I'm trying my best to be PC for my students. But it's a learning process. I mean, as far as things go, they're invasive species, and I do want to give that, you know, the connotation that the term invasive makes a lot of sense because when we think about these species, we're talking about species that have not originated from this area. They don't have an evolutionary background. They don't have an existence in the fossil record, and they do some level of ecological harm. So we do need to think of them from that standpoint. You know, even the term invasive can be considered aggressive, but in some cases, like KR blue stem, it's pretty apt, I would say. So, just for those of y'all who have maybe birthdays coming up in August or September, this might be a good option for y'all as well. I do not get any proceeds, by the way, so this is not me endorsing. So, let me go ahead and explain. Um, it, I originally was coming into this talk to kind of discuss with y'all the impacts of you know, insects and thinking how I would kind of work this into a native plant talk. Obviously, insects are plants. Um, now, after a chance of looking at the events on your uh, schedule, I'm realizing this is actually very appropriate to talk about insects here. Because for, for me, and one of the things I teach my students is that insects are what we often call the little things that run the world. This is a quote, a quote from a very famous entomologist, E.O. Wilson, also the father of conservation biology in many regards. And this has to do with the fact that insects, which are one of the most biodiverse groups of organisms on the planet, are about close to one million species described, and we are lucky to have, by the end of the century, seven or eight more million species to include to that. And all of those species provide a wide variety of ecological roles in the environment, ranging from herbivory, providing resources of energy up the food web from our primary producers, our plants, on up and forward, then our predators that provide that additional energy level going from the primary consumer to the or sorry, primary consumer to the secondary consumer, but also providing some level of pest control as well. So many of our uh, species that are often cause damage to our plants, they can kind of keep in check at low densities in a perfect functioning ecosystem, of course. 
We also have the little fella down here at the bottom. This is our columbula or springtails. These guys help assist with the decomposition of dead organic matter, bringing nutrients back into the soil as plant uh, ready nitrogen or plant available nitrogen. Of course, we also, as a, as a researcher in pollinators, I care a great deal about these fellows right here. The, or I should say ladies in this case. And it's all the ladies that do the work. Uh, happy post-International Women's Day, by the way. Um, but it's worth mentioning that pollinators, very important group, 90% of all of our vascular plants benefit at some level from animal pollination. And of that 90%, 90% of the job is done by insects. And then of course, and Dr. Talley would be proud, and as well as my collaborators would be proud for putting up the photo of the chickadee. Um, insects provide a major food resource for organisms at the next level of the food web, next trophic level up. So it's important that we take into account why insects are important in that regard. But unfortunately, as, as happy as I am to talk to you all about insects, I also need to address the elephant in the room here. But unfortunately, insects are going through a major decline, a decline for, that's been occurring for decades. And scientists have been aware of this for decades, but it hasn't really been reaching a lot of news media until recently. Um, as, as a reference, in 2018, this is when I finished my thesis and started working my way down south to, to Tarleton. And we're still talking about the insect apocalypse today. And this is to do with the fact that there's a wide variety of studies that have been showing these downward declines in insect densities, insect species, and certainly the productivity and resources they provide to us. So this is an example of one of the many studies that came out um, in Europe about, and it's been a 30 to 40 year study that they are kind of ongoing here, looking at daily biomass that they are collecting of insects, the amount of weight, if you will, of insects they would catch on a daily basis all over the period of over 30 years. And you can see that it's been a steady decline ever since. And so this is a study that was shown in Europe that determined that insect biomass has decreased by 80% in 30 years. That's phenomenal, especially given the fact that insects are so super important in terms of maintaining ecosystem integrity. Now in the United States, that number is a little more variable. We have our own studies as well but they range in terms of what we're looking at. They don't necessarily have the same long-term duration that we're observing. And it's also going to be a little bit taxa dependent. So some declines in some species are going to vary in terms of others. Others might actually be improving. So we can look at some of the impacts that are occurring based on the taxa. For order Lepidoptera, uh, one of the ones that Dr. Talmy certainly enjoys, our butterflies, moths, and skippers, we have seen a steady decline over the past few decades as a result of this, but there are many other species that are in far more dire straits. Many of our beetles, many of our spiders, many of our aquatic insects like the caddisflies are equally in trouble. In fact, it's argued that many of the aquatic plant feeding, especially our herb, uh, specialized herbivores and pollinator insects are most at risk for decline. This is perhaps one of the most gloomy of the uh, facts I'm going to be giving you all today. By mid-century, 40% of all arthropod species are expected to go extinct. And if we do nothing to stop this now, it is currently predicted that the majority, over 50% of all insect species, including the species we have yet to discover, are likely to go extinct. So because of these concerns, because of the fact that insects are so essential to the functioning of our ecosystem, there has been a great wealth of literature that has kind of started to develop, trying to establish an understanding as to what is causing the mechanisms of decline. Because if we know what's causing these declines, then we can start working on the solution. And so this graph here is demonstrating the various bits of information of literature that's out there, the wealth of literature that has looked at trying to address these concerns. Among these concerns include several aspects, agricultural intensification, so the conversion of land to farmland, as well as conversion of land to pasture land for raising livestock, urbanization, we can see that pretty clearly happening as y'all leave Fort Worth and coming towards Weatherford. Um, it's argued that the Metroplex will slowly be making its way down to Stephenville as well by 2050, just as an FYI. So get used to a heck of a commute. I'll certainly have some thinking about that in terms of my community. Um, pesticides, pollutants, we, we know about these being the non-target effects they can have on pollinators when they pick it up from feeding on herbicides. 
even even herbicides can have damage now with these guys. Certainly, climate change or the changes in growing temperatures, uh, changes in phenology with the seasons, drought, major factor we had to deal with last year, and guess what? It's going to keep on coming. And then certainly losses of habitat through aquatic systems and forests. But what is relatively lacking in the literature right now is the lack of information on biological invasions. When we talk about global decline, and this is kind of the impetus for the book that uh, we, we've been working on, is the fact that there are there's a lack of information out there as to how invasive species or alien species are causing problems for a wide variety of groups, especially insects. And so for today, what I'm going to try to do is kind of give you all a background of some of the reviews that we've done in terms of this information. And I'm going to be providing you all with some uh, case studies from my research during my master's in South Texas. Um, so trying to bring it as close to local as I can. Um, as a, as a note, uh, Corpus Christi is by no means local for Texas, but it's closer than Delaware. Um, but I will also be talking about some of the mid-Atlantic stuff I, I did for my PhD as well. But we'll be trying to address these three questions today. First, how do plant invasions alter arthropod communities? So looking at insects and allies here. So we're looking at both multiple groups here. From there, how do the changes in these communities following plant invasion contribute to global insect decline? And then finally, what can we do to improve conservation in a time of global insect decline? And I'll try to touch on this last bit a little bit, but I'm certain Dr. Talon will do a better job than I will. Um, introducing his concept of the homegrown national park. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and start talking about insects and arthropods. And what I'm going to do is try to break this down based on functional groups, groups that have similar feeding strategies, similar behaviors. That way we can kind of see the patterns that go with them. We'll start off with herbivores. And many of y'all are aware with our plant feeding arthropods that the majority of our insects out there are plant feeding. And the majority of those are what we call specialists. This means that they feed on one particular plant genus or plant family. It varies based on who you're looking at in terms of different species, because some families in the plant world are pretty darn diverse. So if you're saying you're an aster specialist, that feels like that's cheating. Um, <laughs> one example of, it, of this would be our lovely caterpillar here. Danaeus plexippus, the monarch butterfly caterpillar. And the monarch feeds it as a specialist on various species in Asclepius, in the genus Asclepius, the milkweeds. Although many species have now been removed into their own separate genera, they were primarily considered specialists in that regard. And they have developed very specialized methods in their physiology to overcome many of those cardioglycosides that are present in there to overcome the toxicity. But it is worth mentioning that they're not the only specialists out there. To kind of give a, a little bit of love for some trees that are not often represented well in the landscape, I, put, I propose to you all sumac, a wonderful plant with great fall color, a plant that provides a lot of good resources for uh, migrating birds, especially with the high levels of fat they have in their berries. For some reason, everyone assumes when I say the word sumac that this is going to be the thing that gives you a rash. I'm not sure why. But even though it's slightly related to poison ivy, it is not going to cause any of that problems. But sumac has a wide variety of specialists as well. Here's an example of the spotted titana, a caterpillar that I grew up with and uh, fell in love with when I was doing my PhD work up in the Atlantic. This is a sumac specialist. Down here in Texas, you'll have this lovely specimen. This is the showy emerald. This is a geometer or, a, or an inchworm. Although if you look at the caterpillar here, it resembles very well a dried up piece of stem. That's the idea to hide from predators. Um, a little less charismatic, but still a very important group, the sumac leaf beetle, including the larva that covers itself in poop as a way to avoid getting eaten. It took me a very long time to find a photo of this larva that wasn't completely covered in poop, so you can at least see what it looks like. <laughs> but these are all examples of the various kinds, uh, just some of the specialists that you could have. But what happens if we have a situation where these sumacs get displaced by the non-native species? Like, for example, with China berry, a common species that does kind of creep in and push out a lot of the plants in the understory before it starts making its way into maturity into the canopy. What we typically see is a loss of all these specialists, because many of these species depend on one or two plant species 
as a food source. They can't recognize this as a food source because it lacks the right chemistry. It <laughs> lacks that lock and key mechanism that's necessary for them to recognize it. And then the toxicity. There are many uh, chemicals in many of these plants that many insects need to initiate whether or not they want to feed and to get around those potential defenses. If they don't have the right lock and key mechanism from that standpoint either, there's a good chance they won't be able to complete the development. And that's the problem that comes with the introduction of many of these alien plants, is that when you lose specialized foods resources for these guys, they can't compete, they cannot function here. So the loss of many of our native plant hosts will lead to a loss of herbivores as a result. In other words, no food, no arthropods. Um, and that's something we've seen with the majority of studies. The majority of reviews that we observed, about almost three-fourths of all studies observed here, result in a scenario where we see a decline in many of our herbivores. So this seems to be the norm rather than the exception to the rule. Now to kind of provide some uh, support for this, we can look at some of the stuff I did in South Texas. So to give you all a, a background of what I was doing, I did my research down at the Welder Wildlife Refuge in southern Texas, so that's about 40 minutes north of Corpus Christi. I'm just kind of driving along the US 77 for those of y'all who got to hang out by the Gulf area. Um, and we were looking at two different plant communities. We were looking at monocultures of old, what we refer to now as old world blue stems, but that's not the collective term we're supposed to be using. Um, because a certain group of ranchers would like us to stop referring to their names when we talk about certain grass species. <laughs> but this includes one particular species, whose name I won't mention here, but right there. Um, monocultures of that particular species, and compared that to native plant communities just literally a quarter mile away. And that's what we were trying to look at, is trying to see if the arthropod communities differed from one another, just to kind of look at what the community structure looked like. Although, many of these studies never occur in a vacuum. And for those of y'all who might remember what 2011 was like in Texas, these are our you know, cool to hot maps showing the intensity of drought. And so while we were doing this research, this is what it looked like year round. And this is what it stayed year round in terms of studying uh, the impacts of these arthropod communities. We had very severe drought in our first year. and. By the time we got to 2013, we got to the what they call the abnormally dry period, so no longer officially drought conditions. But needless to say, we got to observe how drought and invasion can kind of work in tandem to mess with diversity. So what I'm going to show you in the next slide is going to be some data. I mean, we're going to be looking at the results of this. To kind of educate you on what we're looking at here. These little these plots we'll have in blue is going to be our native communities. In our red are going to be our alien species, and we're going to be looking at the averages between these. And we're looking at plant species richness on the left, on the mixture on the left graph, and then on the right graph here is percent form cover. So essentially, looking at native plant cover. And this shouldn't be too surprising because I referred to the term monoculture up here, but it is worth mentioning just for the sake of science. Yes, we have more plant species in the native plant community and more native plant cover, varying, of course, here by the kinds of droughts of tolerant species that start showing up. Got to love croton um, as a result of this. In other words, we have more native plant cover and more native species in the native communities. And what that essentially should mean for us here is that these overall blue stem grasses essentially reduce the availability of food resources for the insects. So, Based on this assumption, we should predict that we should see fewer species of herbivores and fewer herbivores in general, both the number of species and the densities. So, unfortunately, when I was putting this presentation together yesterday, uh, my computer crashed, so I had to borrow my, uh, my publication uh, graph for this. So it's going to be a little bit different in terms of coloration. But to outline here in terms of species richness, these are the arthropods we're looking at. The triangles are going to be our native community. The circles are going to be our old blue stem community. Generally, you see an increase in the number of species. The size of those shapes are a little bit larger for visual purposes, but there is a difference between them. It's just not nearly as severe as we saw with the plant community, so about one or two species difference. However, this is where things get a little screwy. When we look at herbivore abundance, instead of seeing fewer herbivores in the invaded communities, we see more. 
and it becomes more and more pronounced as drought goes away. So this is the exact opposite of what I just showed you in terms of the, the results. This is the exact opposite of the 70 to 75 percent of all studies point towards this. And this actually is an important thing to understand because not all invasive plants demonstrate that herbivores decrease or we don't usually see these declines in all the communities. And so some people may take this data and say to you that, look, invasive plants are fine. Clay, you know, Claybird blue stem and KR blue stem are perfectly fine because animals are just doing fine out there. They're all over the place, and I'm not seeing any major declines in animals or any insects for that matter because there are insects living in these plots. But we need to talk about what's going on here to have a better understanding of how the relationship goes. So let's roll back here to staghorn sumac. Let's say instead of staghorn sumac getting replaced by china berry, we look at another non-native uh, woody plant that we don't care for. Tree of Heaven. Now, Tree of Heaven is more of a problem in my neck of the woods back east, but it's certainly a problem in the riparian zones around here. Now, Tree of Heaven, like you saw right here, is that it does not provide food resources for sumac. So our sumac specialists out of the system. And that's the key here. The loss of native plant hosts result in the loss of our specialist herbivores. The majority of our insect herbivores are specialized to one or two plant lineages. But that doesn't mean that all insects are specialists. So whoever is able to feed on this will likely be of one or two things. They'll either be a species that can feed on a wide variety of food sources, are generalists, or they could be alien themselves. They're from, you know, they're not from this part of the region and they're just identifying the food sources. So who might be feeding on Tree of Heaven? And I hope you don't see too many of these guys. This fellow right here is called the spotted lanternfly. It's a major invasive in the eastern United States right now. Um, to my knowledge, it has not been detected in any numbers in Texas, but I'm on, 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 I'm on call for this. So if you all do see this, let me know immediately so we can confirm it. Because this is a species that likes to feed on Tree of Heaven to acquire the toxins to make itself a very nasty, poisonous creature. So birds won't want to eat it, nothing will want to stop it. But it also feeds on a wide variety of other species. Over 200 species of plants have been report reported for this one, so it's very much generalist, including grape and hops. So my college students really care about these species. <laughs> Also, this fellow right here, this is called the Elianthus webworm. Elianthus is because of the name of the genus that it usually feeds on. This is a species that was once restricted to southern Florida, and that's where it was to stay with the native versions of the, of the Tree of Heaven. But when Tree of Heaven became a major landscaping plant, this thing spread to wherever Tree of Heaven went. So it is also a, in many ways, it's now considered a non-native of Texas. So you kind of think of this as the, you know, the Texas winter birds coming in as a result of this. So the point is we have situations where we have species that can come in because of other alien species. And so let's go back to look at this urban war abundance situation. Because when we looked at the number of species here, we didn't see much of a difference in species, but it mattered to figure out the identity. So we found out that two species dominated this community. The first one was this little fella down here. Really tiny, the size of a pinhead, so you know, please appreciate the amount of time and effort it took me to count all these things. <laughs> these are called Machlozetan mites. And these mites are very small, they're generalist feeders, they'll feed on a wide variety of plants, grasses, forbs, they're not picky. But if there is an available resource that they don't have to exploit or they don't have to compete with one another, they're gonna take it. And so these guys pretty much represented the bulk of insects feeding in the uh, KR blue stem and Claver blue stem communities. In fact, they were found here about three to four times as many than our native plant communities. They were there at very low densities, but in the invaded communities, loved it. This is the other one that showed up. The Red Street Leafhopper, a relative newcomer to Texas, came, showed up in around 2010 um, in, along the highways outside San Antonio and was associated and found to be associated with KR blue stem. We also found it associated with Claybird blue stem. It is a non-native species who happens to share the same native range as Claybird blue stem. So it's originally from north, northern parts of Africa, the Middle East, and parts of Asia. 
Interestingly enough, this species didn't show up on our plots or until the, the grasses were in flower. And we wonder why. When we put these guys under a microscope, that is not me doctoring their appearance, by the way. That is the same size and shape as a florence. So this gives you an idea of what these guys are doing. They were there in large numbers during the period of time in which the grasses were in flower. They were not there at all after the flowering. They were nowhere near the native plants. So here we see an association based on their evolutionary relationship. And that's the point here is that when it comes to these herbivores, if we do see benefits from non-native plants or alien plants, it's because they have to either share some sort of relationship with them already, so aliens bringing in more aliens, or we might have a situation where you have a generalist that can benefit from it. But even then, the generalist may just be using it because no one else is, or it's the only option. Much like for any of y'all on a road trip, if Whataburger is the only choice you got, after you've had it for a week, you get tired of it, but you know, well, at least it's open 24-7. So the point is, arthropods which dominated these communities were likely going to be generalists or alien herbivores. And we see this time and time again. Anytime you have a species from Asia that comes in, for example, you start seeing the community kind of switching over to providing for Asian species. Anytime you bring a European plant in, you'll start providing resources for European insects, for example. So, you know, as much of a melding pot that America wants to be, you know, it is a little concerning when you start seeing the Americans getting kicked out of the system. So that's how herbivores kind of behave. And we're going to kind of crawl back to herbivores in a bit because everything is connected. But let's go ahead and start talking about the tritivores, the decomposers of plant material. And I put this lovely little isopod up here, the roly-poly or sow bug. Depending on where you come from, you might have different names for it. But these guys are important in processing, taking uh, dead plant material, breaking them down to smaller pieces for bacteria and fungi to help kind of break it down. And they kind of serve the first step of the decomposition process. How these guys are affected by not alien plants was kind of interesting. Because going back to our example of uh, the tree of heaven here, if nothing is feeding on these guys as adults, or as, as they're developing, so none of our herbivores are feeding on them, all that biomass, all that weight has to go somewhere. And so if nothing's feeding on them while they're alive, something might feed on them while they're dead. And so all this abundant biomass becomes an available food resource in the litter layer. And that, in turn, might just be a good food resource for the detritivores. So there is some thought that's... Uh, when you introduce these non-native plants that aren't being eaten by herbivores up in this section of the food web, all of that moves downward into the tritivores. This is a term that we started referring to as from green to brown, because we're moving from the green food web, living plants to herbivores and then everything up there, to brown, so dead vegetation to the tritivores. And this is interesting from that perspective because that means the energy is moving in a different direction and some organisms who might be living way up on those trophic levels, way up high on those different food webs, might not be able to acquire these resources. And this was what started um, kind of the focus of my PhD project when I went to uh, the Mid-Atlantic region is we wanted to explore whether or not we saw this trend occur. And so to do this, we did, uh, for my PhD, we did 96 different sites in four different states, so we kind of went across the mid-Atlantic region. That sounds like a lot of areas, but it's probably just central Texas, comparatively. <laughs> um, and we looked at eight different species of invasive plants out in the mid-Atlantic region. Some of these are uh, some groups that you all might be familiar with. Um, some notable groups down here that are often creeping up in people's suburbs or in residential areas. Um, and you know, certainly this is one that you might see in East Texas as well, kind of creeping into the into the woody plants area. But our pl our plan was to look at again those monocultures and looking at those areas where they were dominant, and then comparing them to native plant communities and trying to see if there were differences among the different kinds of insects and arthropods associated with that. So the next slide I'm going to show you is something a little more commonly seen when it comes to the herbivores. I'll actually show you herbivore richness and abundance here between all eight of these candidate plants. Again, the same idea as before. The red is going to be our non-native groups. The blue is going to be our natives. 
And what you're going to see here is a relationship between herbivore species richness and then all of our eight candidates. For the sake of argument, I put these little asterisks up here to show you all what we would consider to be significant or statistically significant or meaningful in terms of our work. And what we saw is that seven out of eight of our comparisons showed that there were fewer species of herbivores associated with alien plants. In other words, the aliens reduced the number or the diversity of the plant feeders. And then likewise, when we look at herbivore density, we see that, once again, fewer herbivores with alien plants. So this follows more of that 70 to 75 percent typical pattern. For those of you all who were talking earlier about what kind of plant species we might want to care about when it comes to deer tolerant species down here, our only comparisons we had in the eastern United States to compa compare with multiflora rose were species that the deer left alone. Um, and most of those species were pretty heavy in toxins and chemicals to kind of prevent them from being eaten by uh, herbivores. Um, it's not a common species here in Texas, but if you go a little bit further east of the DFW, you might start picking up something we call spicebush, Lindera benzoin. Um, that is a species that deer do not care for whatsoever. And for those of you all who have ever smelt it, you kind of have an idea. It smells a lot like, uh, like the allspice uh, kind of spray that, or the Axe body spray that people use a lot. Um, so, you know, maybe something you enjoy when you're younger, but definitely not something you want to put in your mouth. So, white-tailed deer did not care for these, and neither did our herbivores for that matter. So that's why we didn't see much difference here. But for the candidates that were feeding on these invasive plants, who were they? Same rule applies as before. Generalists and aliens themselves. Kind of the main one we started seeing with a lot of our species from Asia, or that oriented from Asia, is this fellow here, the citrus uh, plant hopper, or the citrus plant hopper. And that one is both a generalist feeding on about 300 or so species of plants, but also a major invasive on its own right. So, with this understanding that there's fewer biomass and fewer energy going into the green food web, let's take a look at the brown food. And what we see is, when we look at just density of detritivores, five out of eight of our candidates show this kind of appearance where detritivores seem to be actually increasing, um, or having greater amounts or densities of detritivores over the native communities. And some of the ones we didn't see that was largely due in part to kind of the wide variety of, uh, or the lack of litter availability in some cases. Um, this one in particular is, is suspect because this was occurring actively in the riparian zone, so not a lot of organic material to sit there on top of the rocks. But it's worth mentioning who are these guys? Who are the players here? And the players who are detritivores, it's the same story as our herbivores generalists and alien species. So alien cell bugs, alien millipedes. These guys are actually interestingly associated with the plants they were with. So many of our cell bugs that we have around here are non-native. They're actually from Europe. And many of them are associated with the European species of plants. This particular species right here is what we often call the greenhouse millipede um, because it shows up in greenhouses all the time. It's associated with many Asian species of plants. The exception up here is this fella here. This is a little tiny springtail that actually has what we call whole arctic distribution. It's native to North America, but also native to Europe. And it just so happens to recognize orchard grass. And European species of a cool season grass we brought over here for forage uh, for cattle. So the point here is we see alien detritivores associated with alien plant litter. So the same rule applies here. So in many ways, you can kind of start predicting what kind of communities will start showing up here, given enough time for these plants to stick around. Now, we're going to go ahead and give you all an idea of how we determine green to brown. In order to determine green to brown, what we did is we took the amount of herbivores and the biomass of herbivores that we had, and then compared them to the biomass of detritivores. We built this herbivore to detritivore ratio. And what we determined here, as our metric for green and brown, was that our native plants had anywhere between 2 to 24 times as much green energy as brown energy compared to our alien plants, meaning there's a lot more energy moving up the food web than down. And what that essentially means is that generally we see evidence to suggest this green to brown shift occur. So, in some cases, this can be beneficial if you're trying to think about ways to improve your nutrient cycling. 
Um, but in other ways, this can be a really bad way to you know, deal with wildland plants and trying to promote food resources for wildlife. Because now you're taking out the resources that once belonged to many of the insectivorous birds and many of the insectivorous mammals and reptiles and amphibians that depend on those caterpillars or herbivores for food resources. So it's a problematic situation you to see this kind of shift. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about predators here. We need to talk about predators, like our lovely salticid, our lovely jumping spider here. It would be no surprise to anyone that you are what you eat. So for our predators here, these guys depend on their prey resources. And if their prey resources are tied to native plants, then if we were to take native plants out, like taking out our sumac again, then we would lose our specialists and we would lose our predators. And so we propose this hypothesis that the loss of native host plants would lead to a loss of prey. In other words, you take out the first domino or take out the foundation of your food web, everything collapses. What happens if we have this green to brown situation occur where we have food resources down here? That might mean that we might have predators that actually might benefit. And so we might see complex chains of food webs going on down here of predators feeding on the traders. Alternatively, if these guys up here, these predators that fed on the herbivores, were a little more generalized and they can maybe find those resources or utilize them, maybe they can do what we call prey switching, where they could switch over to a more abundant food resource. So we need to determine whether this was a possibility. And so we can look at both the studies I talked to you all about, the South Texas study and the Atlantic study to demonstrate this. So as a reminder, in the South Texas study, we had two major groups of herbivores in the invaded communities, in those alien plant communities, I'm trying to use alien here, um, the mites and the leafhoppers. We had one major species in the Old World Blue Sun community. This dinky little tiny guy also the size of a pinhead, we call these insects thrips, and that is both singular and plural. Um, these guys are specialists on mites. So we have a relationship between these guys and that's about it. There are very few other predators in that environment and very few others found in that plant community. So here we have two species with a single link going upward. Not much in terms of diversity and not much in terms of energy moving up and down. Nothing was really feeding, as far as we could tell, on the uh, invasive leaf hopper. So that's problematic right there. The food web was more or less restricted, which means not a lot of energy going up to supply the vertebrates that need to be functional in this uh, community. Now looking at the Mid-Atlantic study, we can look at herbivore abundance again. So as a reminder, when we're looking at these uh, native communities compared to the alien communities, Natives had a lot more. Let's see what happens with the predators. The predators associated with the green food web. We saw that there were, as a result of having fewer predators, we, or fewer herbivores, we saw fewer predators. So that holds true so far with that hypothesis. You lose the food resources, you lose the hunters. But we didn't see that with the brown food web. When we looked at the tritivores here, we did not see a differences between the native and non-native communities here. And so this might suggest that even though we see increased numbers of detritivores, those detritivores aren't being the food resources that the predators want. Many of these groups have their own toxins and sulfides in them. Basically, they smell and stink, and no one wants to eat them as a result. It's like eating rotting eggs. Very few things want to eat rotting eggs. And that was the idea here. Even though we saw increased the tritivore numbers, we did not see that improve in terms of food resources for predators. So, in other words, this green to brown thing isn't providing anything in terms of resources. It's not providing benefits for the food web. So it really is nice and brown and stinky. So, taking this all together, when an alien plant dominates a system, typically we see the diversity and the density of arthropods decrease. And this has to do with the fact that these arthropods lack the relationship with this new plant host. If they do benefit, then it's because they have some shared relationship with them, often the result of being alien themselves. But this, again, is an exception to the rule. This is few and far between. 
Typically what we end up seeing is that a loss of native plants leads to a loss of food for the herbivores, a loss for organisms higher up the food web, so our predators end up getting detrimental. And while there might be some benefit for certain detritivores, if we're not seeing a case where detritivores are increasing, this could also lead to a loss in nutrient cycling and the resources that our detritivores typically provide. In other words, it's all stinky all the way down, and that's the key here is that when people talk about invasive plants not being that bad in the system, I'm gonna be honest with you, if, it's hap if this is what it's causing and this is the next step in the food web, then it's a problem that we need to address, especially if this is contributing to insect decline. So how this contributes to insect decline? It's worth mentioning that when we talk about alien plants, or we talk about invasive plants, what have you, Plants do get here on their own. They don't necessarily need to have us moving them about, and there are some cases where it happens naturally. Cases such as with birds depositing seeds as they migrate through, that can lead to sometimes new interactions. But more often than not, it happens what we call anthropogenically, human-induced. And in truth, human-driven introductions occur at an exponential rate. They happen far more often than our natives. And this has to do with the fact that we are currently living in a geological era that we call the Anthropocene, the human-induced system, where because of our methods of travel, of trade, of interactions, this has led to us having an increased uh, opportunity for more interactions, more introductions of this nature. To give you an example, there's over 13,000 species of plants that have been introduced and reported introduced through human activity alone. That's about close to 4% of all plants described in the plant kingdom. So it doesn't sound too bad, but if over 3,000 species of plants in the U.S. are considered invasive, that's problematic. And because most of those species, and you can find this now, but the majority of our forests are usually composed of about 20 species, four or five of which are typically invasive. So that has really significantly reduced our overall diversity. And it's expected that these introductions will continue to occur because of our increased trade, our increased travel, and urbanization as well. So the, this is a trend that is expected to keep increasing. So expect to see even more species being introduced. The problem that comes into this, and this is a problem you all have probably heard before, that most people, when you talk to them about invasive plants or alien plants, they assume that this is largely just a problem for naturalized land. This is a problem for the native species. So these are things that need to be managed in wildland areas. They need to be managed in parks, in natural resource areas, in public lands. But in urban areas, in your own backyard, they don't need to be managed because that's where they're there. That's where we take care of them. And that's problematic in and of itself as well. Because in truth, the majority of our land nowadays, and this is not just for U.S., but also much of the world, is privatized. Over 75%, or close to 75% of all land in the United States is privately owned. And that also means that that's where you will see a lot of non-native plants, a lot of non-native species starting to, do, starting to be introduced or manicured or produced for the purpose of commercial sale, for example. So as an example, about 73% of the U.S. is privately owned, and 22% of that land is currently dominated by plants that we have in the ornamental horticultural plant trade. And that can be very problematic because one of the things that's always worth mentioning is the fact that many of these invasive plants, before they were invasive, we introduced them intentionally. And this goes into the, a comment that Dr. Talamy will, will certainly echo, that just because an alien plant is considered just non-native right now and not a problem, doesn't mean it won't become invasive in the future. Anybody know what this plant is? That's zoo. That's zoo, very good. <laughs> the supposed plant that ate the sow. This is a and this is a plant that was introduced during the centennial of Philadelphia, so 1876. And it was introduced as a gift and as intent to kind of show off the aesthetic because it has a very pretty flower. It is a useful plant that grows on trellises and on, and on fences. And we may have gotten a little too overzealous trying to use them as a way to keep the Dust Bowl from ever happening again. Because this is a thing that they do, form these massive monocultures that climb over everything, crawl over everything, suffocate everything. 
The point is, when it was first introduced, it wasn't a problem. And it wasn't a problem for decades until optimal conditions were met to create this. And this is the same thing we saw with KR Bluestem or flavored Bluestem. This is the same thing we saw with many of our plants like Bradford Pear. This is something we saw with Tree of Heaven. All of these were introduced at one point or another for some other intended purpose. Um, you know, the altruistic ideas, best laid intentions, but eventually all roads lead to hell in this case from a, from a basic plant standpoint. So we need to take into account that just because it's non-native now and not a problem doesn't mean it won't become invasive later. And this is the problem that comes with many of our invasive species. The primary thing they do is they displace natives and form these monocultures, which limit the availability of host plants and forage in the environment. And when our insects can't see this as a food source, they can't recognize it, they can't metabolize it, they can't break the chemicals down and use it for nutrition, then in many ways, this is what we will refer to as a food desert. For our monarch butterflies, for example, this field that has probably been sprayed to death with a certain herbicide failed to destroy milkweeds, and this uh, turf grass area, this nice open lawn, might as well be asphalt to them. They can't utilize it as a food source. They can't lay their eggs on it. Their young cannot grow here. And this is the problem we see more and more frequently occurring in private land, especially now that land is becoming more and more uh, privatized, more purchasable. In fact, that many of our landscapes are, have large swaths are now being broken down to more suburban landscapes. And we have increased amount of urbanization, fewer people, living in the rural landscapes and the farmlands, and now moving into the cities. So this trend will keep occurring. And it's worth mentioning that it's not just insects that are declining. And it, I can't help but think that some of these declines are linked. Because when we think about bird declines that have been occurring for a matter of decades, much like the long-term declines of insects, and given the fact that many of these birds that we have here, whether it's our shorebirds that feed on crustaceans, whether it's our forest birds that depend heavily on caterpillars for the breeding plumage, grassland birds that depend on uh, grasshoppers and various other groups in those areas, certainly insectivorous birds that depend on many of our midges, flies, and what have you, the fact that they all depend on these food resources you know, for the breeding season and keep their populations going. If you lose the plants, and you lose the insects, then everybody else in the food web tumbles down like a game of Jenga. And that's a game I really don't want to be playing. So with that in mind, what can we do to improve insect conservation? It's, we're at the insect apocalypse, it is here. But that doesn't mean the end is nigh. There is a chance for redemption. And as much as I'd like to say that the thing we should be really doing is going to these farms and going to these uh, public lands, going to the highways and rewilding them, providing all these wildflowers, providing all these resources, it's not enough. Again, the idea here is that when we look at public lands, because everyone focuses on trying to remove the invasive plants and bring back native diversity to these areas, public land is a minority now. The effort needs to be done by the landowners we need to t start taking into account the importance of what we often refer to as the stewards of the land. We need to take that to heart. And I know many of y'all have heard this before. I'm preaching to the choir here. This is the Native Plant Society of Texas. Y'all are already on board with me on this. But we also need to get other people on board. So I'm not saying don't talk to your senators, don't talk to your representatives. Please do, because they provide the funding to encourage easements from a state and federal level to encourage more people to do this. But we also need to have more call to actions and more awareness about the importance of planning native. So some of the things we'll talk about here are examples that Dr. Talon will certainly bring up. Many of y'all already know about this organization. The concept of the homegrown national park. This came up as an idea uh, during many of Dr. Talon's talks. And those of y'all who don't know this, go ahead and do a Google search for homegrown national park. It'll come up fairly quickly. But the idea here is that if we provide a small portion of our land to be a pocket prairie, or just provide native plants, even just planting 10 plants on your property, if you do that, and your neighbor does that, and their neighbor does that, then together we can build a native plot that is bigger than any national park in the US. 
And that's the idea. Because the, the effort and the power is in the private landowners now, this is what we need to be doing. And so for those who are interested in it, they, this website provides you with not only the steps and the tools you need to help kind of develop your own, uh, you know, your own property for native pollinators, native butterflies, native wildlife, but it will also give you some bragging rights because you can sit here on the map and actually put your, your property saying, I am contributing to native biodiversity. I am contributing to fighting back the in global insect decline. And I want to make this point because only one residence in Weatherford is currently listed as one of those groups. And so those of you who live off of Water Lane, you might know who this person is, just an FYI. Um, but we need more people to jump on it. And it's also worth mentioning that the social media for this is phenomenal. So those of y'all who are fans of Facebook or Twitter, uh, these guys have some great little memes that they throw up to kind of remind people about the importance of native plants. So it's always a good thing to kind of show the people, um, you know, as a way to get them involved. Get them involved with the social media groups first, with Facebook, for example, and this can be a great way to kind of get people to learn more. Outside of Homegrown National Park, there are other groups like the Xerces Society, the Professional Society for Insect Conservation. They actually have certification programs. Um, some of you all may be familiar with the training programs going on right now to be a pollinator steward, the pollinator stewardship program. My grad students are currently doing that right now, and so hopefully they will be able to move out into the rest of Texas and teach people and preach the good word of pollinators. But Xerces Society also provides opportunities for certification of your city to be bee friendly, and this is one thing that they can do. They can, you know, by promoting certain ideas like planting native and providing resources for different plants, reducing your reliance on pesticides, and encouraging city officials and municipal uh, organizations to try to do their best to make people aware of monarchs and bumblebees and the importance of our native pollinators. You can get your city certified and registered as certified as a Bee City Texas or a Bee City USA designation. And there are even colleges that get to do this as well, the Bee Campus USA. Um, I'm sorry to say that Tarleton is not a member of that, neither is Steve Wheel, we're working on it. And if you are interested in doing that for Webford too, there's nothing here. Um, you know, I'd be more than happy to kind of work with y'all on that. As of right now, in terms of places, Abilene Christian University, ABC, has done a great job of actually being able to put together their B city or B campus. And there's certainly plenty of them in, you know, down in Austin. There's a few in the DFW area that's done a good job. But I would like to see some more right here, especially given the fact that we are in a monarch highway. So it would be nice to see a little bit of that going on here as well. Finally. And I would be remiss if I didn't do this as a Taliban student. We have to talk about the native plant finder. So if you don't know what kind of native plants you would like to provide, or if you have friends and family members who would like to know more about what kind of plants they should put in their property, but they don't live around here, you can always direct them to this website. The native plant finder provides you, if you put in your zip code, it will provide you with the most productive plants that are available for pollinators, and for caterpillars. So those of you all who care about your butterflies, this is what it will give you the options for. And so it can give you some, some thoughts on the kind of plant species you might want to build a wildlife-friendly garden or a wildlife-friendly property. So I would, I would very much recommend you all use this if you haven't done it already. It's often very useful to get a rough idea of what you have out here. I'll tell you right now, though, some of you will be frustrated if you try to encourage people to plant goldenrod on their property. Um, because that will show up as number one on this for a lot of our butterflies. And I have to do the PSA every year. It's not goldenrod that causes people to suffer from fall allergies. But even then, the ragweed that does cause that is number two. So it's a little bit difficult sometimes to make that argument. So I think I've chatted you all off for quite a bit here. I will provide you all with just the, the typical thanks and acknowledgments for this. My email address is down here if you all ever want to ask questions. I often get people sending me photos of what's this bug, and I'm more than happy to do that. It's part of my job. Um, I also have Twitter, but I hardly ever use it. I apologize for that. I'm working on trying to be more socially inclined. But with that being said, if we have time, I'd be happy to take questions. And thank you all very much. Well, you know, uh, I will state this, and I should probably start this off by making a, a statement. 
I am what you might call a dang Yankee, because I'm originally from the North. So I, I go to talks, I talk to people about this, and usually it comes up that because this Northerner is showing up, no one wants to hear what he has to say to the Texans. But I will say that Texans are doing a much better job than some of the states I've been in. First off, Texas Blue Bonnet. You know, it's, it's a fairly common species that you kind of see throughout the roadsides and everything, but it's still a very valuable plant from a pollinator standpoint, and we need to give credit where credit's due on that. The fact that many, you know, and, and y'all are uniquely suited for this, because where I'm originally from, it's an area that gets a lot of rainfall and a lot of milder uh, seasons. Down here in Texas, it's dry, it's tough, and it's hardy which means your natives are far more uniquely suited to live here than any of the non-natives people bring in. Oaks are not as common in the landscape north of Texas. The fact that you all have a lot of native oaks that are commonly incorporated from nurseries and you know into, into gardens, into yards, is a blessing because oak trees are typically the most productive native trees we think of. Um, but, you know, certainly Dr. Callaway will update y'all in terms of the number of species that caterpillars go by. I think it's around 530 species of caterpillars that can be, uh, that can be uh, provided for food from oak trees. But, you know, that's the first step. But the biggest problem is, yes, I understand, there are many people who might not get the hint that we need to start thinking about native plants as, as an option in gardens. Not as an enemy, but as an option. They're not weedy. Um, you know, there have been talks about trying to change the perspective, like changing the name of milkweed, for example, because you hear the word weed at the end of something, and that really sounds like something you want to get rid of. Um, the other thing that's worth thinking about is trying to understand the values of your landowners, of you know, your neighbors. What do they want to see on their property? What do they want? If they want space for their kids to run around in, then, you know, there's certainly grasses that can provide that. But I am going to be willing to state that if we have Bermuda grass in St. Augustine out there, you're going to be providing resources for fire ants. And that's probably the last thing you really want to have for your kids running around barefoot in the environment, you know, aside from rattlesnakes. But that's an important thing to you know, understand. So what do they value? If there's certain colors they want to see on their property, then we can maybe advise them in that direction. But it's also worth thinking about you know, the market as it is. We're, we're kind of in a situation where the demand for native plants are starting to outcompete the supply. And so the question is, who can provide native plant species? We all have native plant sales here, but how often do we get people coming in that aren't already part of the organization buying those plants? How do we get the word out that they, you have these resources? If they want to know how to do this, if they want to know how to be able to plant in their landscape, and they want to know what kind of species to get, where can they find that information? So that's the big question. That's the million dollar question. How do we link what people want to native plants, and how do we demonstrate that there is a supply for their demand? There are smarter people than me that are trying to figure that bit out. And, but, and when they figure it out, I will let you all know. But this is where we need to start thinking about the importance of collaboration. This, no human here is an island. We all need to work together. From the science aspect, that means I got to work with the landscapers, I got to work with horticulturalists, I got to work with the gardeners and find out what they're looking for and how we can provide these resources. And we're slowly working towards that. But we also need people like y'all who are out there, who are part of the communities, who know who wants what and, and figure out how we can get it. And two, like when we do our plant sales, we used to buy from a nursery that had native plants, and we lost that native to that nursery. She went out of business, and she was a member of our group. But the other nurseries around don't have native plants because we would, you know, buy their, you know, stock. If it was available, and then there's loads, there's some mm -hmm. there's, you know, and then they wild. sell a lot of alien species. So yeah, and they'll claim yeah. those to be wildlife friendly, right? Yeah. Like the blood flower or the tropical milkweed shows up all the time. Yeah. Well, so, and on that, mm -hmm. I watch HGTV, and there's certain like advertisements or even stuff just from HGTV. I'm like, it is so wrong. It is mm. so wrong, and so. 
you know, and I don't know how we get the word to some of those influencers at those organizations where they can go there. I know on, you know, like Walmart definitely looks at the carbon credits. There's a way to relate native plants to carbon credits. They might buy in because they're really looking at how can they reduce their carbon footprint. So there's some of those things that we can figure out how to get the word into the right people. You know, it just takes the right ear to make it happen. Can I get an issue? I'm going to get a fire ants. Is there a reason, I mean, is there something we can say that you plant these, your yard that's full of, uh, St. Augustine is attracting fire ants? So, there is a, um, that's so, a deal breaker, though, yeah? <laughs> they pull up all <laughs> So, you know, when you look at the, these turf grasses, we have St. Augustine, and it's, it's it, Bermuda is really more the problem than St. Augustine, to be honest, okay. but this is what you'll see. You'll see usually these mounds that are kind of built around the crowns of the, of the grasses. And so when you look at the clumps of them, why are they doing that? Ants are insects with a sweet tooth. They like sugar. This is why we often see ants farming aphids like cattle do, to get that honeydew. There's a certain kind of scale insect that actually feeds at the base of a lot of these Bermuda grass plots. And that's what they're doing. They're building their nest around them to get the food source. So, you know, much like we talked about the idea of, of an alien plant providing a food resource for an alien herbivore, now you're providing it for an alien food web because these species that we're bringing in are often you know, South American in origin, the scale is South American, and the red imported fire ant is from South America. So this is where it's all kind of following suit. We do have native fire ants, but those fire ants do not do anything like the red imported fire ants do. You can pick them up, you can pet them on the head, but I'm not gonna sing them. <laughs> Sorry? Little black mothers? Well, we got a few of the little, little black ones, but there's a lot of these really small ones that are a lot more docile. Funny story, they're actually more drought tolerant than the uh, red imported fire ants. They do much better during our dry periods. They eat me every time I go out in the yard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> with, with everybody that just loves to irrigate everything all the time. When, when they start looking at their water bill, mm -hmm. um, that could be another way of approaching it. Because most of the natives, if you pick them right, don't take as much water in irrigation. Yeah, so. It takes three, a while to notice that. That's a big one. And, you know, you both, you know, several people kind of brought this up, and it's very important. Three words follow the money. And that's usually the best way to get people's attention. At least I've learned that in Texas, is, is you know, start pointing to their wallet. Um, and when you talk about water, that's a big one nowadays. It's, it's an unfortunate truth. It's going to get drier here. The arid line is expected to move towards I-35 interstate by the end of the century, which means what we got going on maybe in, um, you know, maybe out in you know, Abilene is going to be what it will look like by Fort Worth. And even further, Eastland might also look like that. So, or sorry, Midland. That's what I'm thinking. Midland is, is what it's going to look like. So if that scares you even more than Abilene, just so you know. Um, so, and, and that's one of the big things. As pointed out, our species of natives are hardy. They can tolerate drought. They can tolerate that. And any of y'all who have ever dug up grasses, for example, know that our native species got some really long roots that go all the way down to kind of acquire those, those water sources. Um, and this is where I'm going to give a shameless plug for my graduate student. I have a student who's working on a, on a, on a project called Plant Drips, Drought Resistant Insect Pollinator Studies. She is currently looking at native cultivars and a few other cultivars that have shown to be already drought tolerant and looking at pollinator performance on those. And so we've got a study down in Stephenville. We have our own little plots. We call it the drips plot. Um, so we've got a big giant uh, sign up that says plant drips where she is monitoring and looking at the different plant communities and, or different pollinator communities associated with those plants and building these really cool uh, pollinator networks associated with that. And then we have someone who's doing that same research at Texas and Commerce. And so we're going to be comparing on either ends of that arid line to see how the communities respond over different uh, water regimes. So, stay tuned. We might be able to have some data to give y'all in terms of the plant tolerant species. To be something that happens fast. Yeah. 
Well, we'll definitely, we have already have the first year data. I'll tell you right now, it's been an oasis down there in terms of the resources. You've never seen, I've never seen as many American bumblebees as I did <laughs> this year when we had all those resources for that. Okay, so you guys first, and then I'll get you. Well, I, I've sort of been going through the floor listening to you tonight, and one of the things I'm thinking of is my garden has got cultivars, that, and, and um, a big, you know, this is sort of a learning curve, is like, oh, there's not just the passiflora, you know, we got to get the passiflora from this county, not the passiflora from Connecticut. Mm -hmm. That's not going to work. And that's the kind of um, thing that um, I think I went down the wrong garden path, <laughs> literally, because they, they'll say, native, native plant. But will you explain, um, is, it, is, it, oh, is it sort of okay to have a cultivar, or is it like just as bad as having an invasive plant. Right. So it does depend on what we're looking at. So that's the unfortunate answer is it's, it's not a you know, black and white, but it's many shades of gray here. Um, so it does depend on what cultivar you have. Some cultivars are have been purposely grown for aesthetics, certain colors, like fall color, for example. And that can have potentially some problems. Um, the, we're, we're still looking at studies right now about how some insect species um, may not prefer fall colors or because it's kind of reduced the amount of chlorophyll that's present there. You see that with variegated leaves as well. That's reduced the amount of chlorophyll, so that could be, do, be issues with productivity. Um, but we do also see cases where the cultivars actually kind of grow out once they're kind of put in the wild scenario. Kind of like they, you know, they revert to their natural state like the pigs do. Um, except we want the plants to do that, not the pigs. Um, but it is worth mentioning that we do want to have what we refer to often as local ecotypes, types that have naturally adapted to these environmental conditions here. In many cases, it's, it's okay to not necessarily have an oak tree, for example, exactly from this county, because it could still potentially grow and develop fine. Um, certainly there are concerns genetically um, if you're introducing a new, you know, a new individual that has different genes from the population. So we usually try to encourage people to shop local, to plant local if you can. But typically what ends up happening is if you get an oak tree from New York and you bring it down here, it may do okay right now. Come August, it's going to be a very unhappy oak. So, and that's the other reason we often want to plant local is because we want to use the ones that have naturally adapted to our droughts, to our fires, to our dry spells and our wet spells, to our cold snaps because they are the ones that are going to tolerate it and they're going to be the ones that jump back. So I will say, uh, to kind of give like an anecdote on, on that, um, you know, when I said follow the money, um, I did my PhD work in the East Coast and there's an island I do a lot of my research on, uh, Fisher's Island, so I'm certain they'll be happy to know that I'm actually talking about that. Because um, you know, most people down here don't know the, you know, all the islands that are up there. But Fisher's Island um, is a small island community, and they really wanted to bring natives back to their area. They were doing all these restoration works on the old military bases found on those islands. And one of the problems that presented is they did have a commercial landscaper who lived out there who had, who had a, a business, but they did not necessarily provide the plants that they were looking for, the native plants. And so the people, once we started getting these restoration projects up and going and people wanted native plants on the property, the first thing they would do is they would try to shop local. They would go to the person and ask, do you have this plant? And it's like, no, I don't, but I have these plants that are similar to us. Like, well, no, I want native. And then, you know, after enough time, you started realizing, okay, now I need to start buying, bringing natives into the market so people can shop from me and not shop from the people on the shoreline or on the mainland. And that helped kind of start generating that. There are certain groups that allow that could create that opportunity for y'all. Um, I do know that, for, as an example, another one, uh, Texas A&M AgriLife and um, Texas A&M Kingsville, to a certain extent, they have these uh, large, uh, this large encompassing project in the state called Texas Native Seed. So you may have heard those terms. I used to remember them as the South Texas Natives when I was working in South Texas. They're focusing more so on grasses right now, but they are trying to do this, trying to go from county to county to find the right ecotypes, to develop the right seeds for their grasses, and try to incorporate native species that can provide those resources for rangeland purposes and for wildland restoration purposes.
businesses? So I guess the short answer is it's hard to know what is native. Um, sometimes we can use you know the Google Eco region over there as an example. So if it's found in a county that's in the Cross Timbers, can we use the same one? Um, but if we can encourage people to buy local and know that you're getting it from, for example, Parker County, then try to use the Parker County variety, or then try to use the Parker County eco type. Yes. I had a question about your graduate students, the mm -hmm. DRIPS program. Are they using native plants, or what kind of plants are they studying? Great question. There's about 22 different species that they're currently utilizing. I fought very hard uh, to get most of them as native, but there are some non-natives in there. And they also have several different cultivars as well. So there's several different cultivars. The Turks cap in there. We have our we have a native cone flower, so I think it's Echinacea augustifolia. Augustifolia. Um, we have a few native salvias in there. We have some monardas, um, bee balms or bergamots, depending on which side of the conversation you follow. And we also have plenty of other plants we're kind of putting in there because across the street from it, we also have um, a pollinator garden that we're kind of working on to develop for that purpose too. Have y'all thought about studying the soil in those plots as well as y'all are going along? I'm sorry, say that again? Have y'all thought about studying the soil in those plots as y'all are going along as well? That's a big one. Um, one of the things, we, we do have little soil sensors. We're at taking data on moisture, taking data on nutrient content as well to see how things are going. I would love to do more work with the with the roots biomass because I'm a big fan of the low ground stuff and seeing what's going on. You know, if you can dig it, it's always fun. Um, but you know, that would also damage the plants. So, yeah. and I, I think it is also being used for education and outreach. So the last thing they want me to do is walk in there and start digging up giant holes in the garden. You might be able to do cores, like mm -hmm. cores going down. So that would be a direction we can we might want to consider for that. Yeah, it's good, good, good advice right there. Thank you, thank you very much.